thank you. It is my honor to welcome you guys here to Calvary Boca. We're glad you're here, and we are here for Jesus. We're here to study God's word. We're here to worship him because he's worthy, right? And you're around some people you may know. You may sit next to them every week, but you may not know them. So take a moment before we start. Just greet one another, um, welcome one another, and then let's worship Jesus together.
sorrow comes to steal the joy I When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when
Praise Jesus in this place. Thank you, God. We bless you. You are worthy. So, Jesus, today we thank you. We thank you for the hope that we have. We thank you, Lord, that there is power in your name. We thank you that there is hope in your name. We thank you that we don't have to stand in the, in the response place of looking at circumstances or looking at our fears or looking at our anxiety and, and wondering, Lord, if if you're going to come through, Lord, we don't have to wonder that. We stand not in our fears, but in your love. And because we stand on a firm foundation, the rock that is the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that your love is unfailing. Lord, we know that your arm is strong, that your hand has not been weakened by anything in the world. Lord, you are still holding everything together. And we are held in your grip. Lord, it's not our grip that on you that matters, it's your grip on us. And so we thank you for that hope today. But God, we want to become more like you. It's why we've gathered. It's why we've come. We want to be more like Jesus. And we know we fall short. And we confess that. But today, Lord, would you teach us. As we would open, open up your word, Lord, teach us what it means to be your covenant people. How we should act. How we should walk. How we should love. How we should treat one another. Lord, teach us those things by the power of your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. So that we can leave this place different. Lord, so that we can become more like you. Lord, we're made in your image, but we want to be more like your son. So teach us how to do that. We love you, Father, and we thank you for the hope that we have today because the, the tomb is empty. And because the cross paid everything for us, Lord. Thank you for Jesus' sacrifice and thank you for your resurrection. And we pray that today you would fill us with resurrection hope and resurrection life. We love you and we pray this together in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. amen. Thanks for singing with us today, guys. God bless you and you can have a seat. Amen. Welcome, Calvary Chapel, Boca Raton. I'm Pastor Dave. It's great to be with you this morning. Hey, we are in a very special section of Scripture this morning. It's Exodus 
chapter 21. So if you have a Bible, you're going to want to turn there. And there's some great passages in Exodus 21. It's uh, the spiritual significance of being a bond slave, being a slave to Jesus, but being a slave by choice, that you choose Jesus, you choose to serve him and serve his purposes. And then there's another section in Exodus chapter 21. It says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a life for a life. And you know, you've heard that many times, but today you're going to see the context that those verses are in, so you can pay special attention to the context that those verses are spoken of. So uh, have a Bible. They're passing some out. If you don't have one, we'd love for you to have one. A couple of quick announcements uh, before we go to uh, the sermon this morning. It's Move Up Weekend, so if there's any parents in the house, uh, you are invited to a 15-minute informational meeting in the middle school room, which is six, grade 6, 7, and 8, and 678 room is directly behind me across the hall. So right after this service, for 15 minutes, head over to 678, all parents, and get the, there's a lot of new classes, there's some new structure, there's some different opportunities uh, that you all will have to be a part of that. So it's move up weekend. It's also move out weekend for our high school seniors, and they are having a high school graduation party for all high school seniors. It won't be this Sunday, but it'll be the following Sunday at one o'clock over in the HSM portable next Sunday at one o'clock. So if you know a high school senior, just remind them. They probably already know, but uh, we wanted you to know as well. Uh, The next thing, we have Foundations of Faith class. Foundations of Faith, if you're new to your faith or you're new to Calvary Chapel, we would love for you to be a part of Foundations of Faith. It starts today at the 1115 over in Portable 113. So the northwest corner of the property, there's a portable at 1115. And now you might be thinking, well, I'm not all that new to Calvary and I'm not, all that, not that new to my faith, but maybe you know someone who is. Maybe you know someone that says, you know, it'd be great if this particular person could be discipled with the basics, the foundation of faith that they can build on. Well, you could invite that person and say, listen, I'll go with you to the first class. I'll go with you. I'll make sure you find the room. We'll sit down together and we'll go through the class. And I can almost guarantee when you go to the first class, you're going to be like, well, I want to go next week too. And you'll, you'll be hooked. So they're, they go over through uh, different topics like, you know, what is saving faith? How to be an overcomer through trials and tribulations. Uh, what, what does it mean to have two-way communication with God through prayer, to be able to recognize that this is the voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Not just one-way communication, but how to have two-way communication with your Savior. And then also baptism, baptism with water, but also baptism with the Holy Spirit. Walking through Acts chapter 2, spiritually, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, going through all the foundations of your faith. So today, 1115 over in Portable 113, and speaking of baptism, we have a church-wide baptism on Saturday morning, the 18th of June. We're in Pompano Beach where the Atlantic Ocean and Atlantic Boulevard meet from 8.30 to about 10 o'clock in the morning. If you have come to faith recently or a member of your family or somebody you know, you have not been baptized as a, an adult believer, then you're going to want to go there as a public expression of your faith to have an opportunity to be baptized as a believer. So that's our announcements today. If you'll draw your attention to the screens and turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 21 for this morning's message. Do you remember a time in your life when those with power took advantage of you? And no matter what you did, nothing changed. Justice was out of your reach. But now that you're finally free, how will you live?
If you have a Bible today, I'd love for you to open to Exodus chapter 21. Because today we're gonna see how God is inviting his people to be a holy nation. Last weekend, he shared with his people the Ten Commandments. And we realized and talked about the idea that the Ten Commandments are not a checklist for obedience as a stairway to heaven. You don't earn your way to heaven by doing more good than bad or by perfectly keeping the law. No, the law, the Ten Commandments were meant to form the identity and the culture of what it meant to be a holy nation. But those 10 commandments weren't the only commandments God gave. In fact, God would give 603 other commandments, 613 in all. And today, we're going to look at some of the other 603. Now, if you're new to Christianity or new to this church, this entire process of reading some of these laws is going to seem like, I don't understand. So here's what you need to know about Calvary. We don't shy away from teaching the more difficult Parts of the Bible. We teach through the Bible. And so the question is, as we read a law that says, don't cook a baby goat in its mother's milk, hmm, you wonder, what does that mean? Well, some of those laws that seem archaic, but we don't understand that that was, don't imitate the pagan rituals of the nations around you. You're supposed to be a particular type of nation. So not all the laws today will make sense. And some of the laws that seem archaic, in particular about the way that women are treated, or the way that people are sold into servitude or slavery are gonna seem, again, archaic and backwards, but actually, these are some of the most progressive laws. The basis of of human rights and social responsibility that we've ever seen in a charter of a nation. And this charter was written by God himself. 613 laws. In fact, this Mosaic law, the 613 laws, and the covenant that God is going to make with Moses and the people to form this holy nation is actually the basis of a nation that would come after it about 3,000 years. That nation built its own charter, its own declarations. Maybe you'll recognize this declaration that comes from this law. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is our declaration of independence. And we sometimes take for granted that it's self-evident that all of us are created equal, all of us made in the image of God. Where did that come from? In Egypt, that wasn't the case. Pharaoh was God, and people were tokens or pawns for his purpose. Not everyone was created equal. But God is saying, I want to teach you a new way to live and that basis of the law, that we have this right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that that even marginalized and vulnerable people have certain inalienable rights. God's going to lay that out for the people so they can be this holy nation. But it wasn't just declaring In our country, we are free. It wasn't just God saying, you are free. No, the 613 laws are sort of like our constitution. Sort of like all those amendments and laws to make sure that people can live free and with justice and with liberty. And so we read, even in our constitution, this simple line, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, Ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Aren't you grateful we live in a free country, in a free nation, where the founding fathers of our nation used as a basis for our laws this covenant. Now here's the question. Why do we need all of these laws? Why do we need all the amendments, all the federal and state laws that we have? Well, the reason is because if everyone did what was right in their own eyes, well, you've seen what happens during hurricanes when traffic lights go out here in South Florida, right? It's absolute chaos. The book of Judges describes a time in Israel's history where there was no king and there was no ordered set of laws people were following. And it says twice in that book, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And you see some of the most horrific acts 
of human depravity in that book. Even, even parents know this. Listen, parents know that kids need boundaries. If you're raising littles, just raise your hand for a second. You have that tired look on your face. You're exhausted. Raising kids is hard. Parents know that kids need boundaries. They need to be protected from their own choices. The two-year-old cannot make the decision to run into the street because he or she does not yet know the danger of the street. A child needs a bedtime. You don't want to ask your two-year-old, when would you like to go to bed? And would you like a few Red Bull shots before you go to bed? No, you say, no, you're not allowed to have those things. There's a more healthy choice for food, and you need to brush your teeth, and here's a bedtime, and don't run into the street because those laws or boundaries actually protect us, listen, from ourselves. The seatbelt laws, the speeding laws, they're protecting you from yourself, not just the drivers around you that are bad. A good law. Righteous and just laws protect us from ourselves and from people around us who might interpret things in a different way. And so God's gonna go into great detail to create a nation of laws that's rooted in a covenant that they might be a particular type of people. So when we read some of these laws today, you're gonna go, ooh, that seems backward. That seems confusing. Listen, we're not gonna read all 603. You can relax. We're gonna read a spattering of different laws to give an idea of the main principles behind why God would give these laws to his people. So, are you ready today? Yes. I can't hear you in Plantation or Boca or North Lauderdale. Are you ready today? Yes. Okay, here we go. Exodus chapter 21, after the Ten Commandments, here's what Moses wrote. These are the laws that you are to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. And if he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. And if his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master and only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges and he shall take him to the door or doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl then he will be his servant for life. Now, already you're like, huh, I don't, I don't get that one. So, so what we're gonna read, in the very beginning of these laws, you're gonna see the word free like four times in just the first seven verses. God's talking about what does freedom look like and what does justice look like. And, and so as a principle of the law, God's gonna begin by talking about people who are indentured servanthood. We might call it slavery. We'll talk about that in a second. He's gonna talk about the rights of women, the rights of children, the rights of immigrants, the rights of the poor, the widow and the orphan, the quartet of the vulnerable. God is starting his nuances of the law by saying that this holy nation will be judged in part by the way it cares for its most vulnerable members. And there's something powerful about that idea. You can write down the simple idea. Justice leads to freedom. We talk about this idea, uh, liberty and justice for all in our Pledge of Allegiance, a nation where there's freedom, liberty, and justice for all. These two ideas are deeply connected because if there is not equity in the society, only certain people are free. And God is saying, no, I, I wanna do this in a different kind of way. Now, when we think about the idea of slavery, Often we think of slavery as the type of slavery that, that the Hebrews endured, where they were the property of the Egyptians, and they were the property of the Egyptians for life, or American slavery, where, where a person was a possession. But God is saying that the, the type of indentured servant that I'm talking about is if someone finds himself in a situation of slavery, and there's three reasons why that would happen in the ancient world. One is you got into debt, and you couldn't pay back your debt. So you basically say, well, I don't have a Bank of America to take a loan and there's no, there's no mortgage company, so I'm, I'm basically gonna have to give you my service for six years, but the seventh year, I know I'll go free, so I'm giving myself to pay my debt. The second, you're a thief, and you steal something, and you get caught, and now, instead of going to jail for the rest of your life, you're gonna work for that person for six years to pay off your debt, but the seventh year, you're gonna go free. It's not permanent. 
Or back in the day, if you were a young girl and your dad had arranged a marriage for you, he would give this daughter to a family and that daughter would work for that family and eventually she would become uh, the wife of someone in that family. Each of these were forms of indentured servanthood. And God is saying, even in that system, I want to create both dignity and rights and establish what it means to be human, what it means to be in living in a free and a just society. And then, and then he offers this interesting opportunity. He says, you know, if you work for someone for six years and you and your wife and your kids so love working in this home that there can come a time where you're like, I, I don't want to leave. And as a voluntary act of a bond servant, you would say in front of judges, I want to take my, my body, I want to place my ear on the doorpost, drive an awl, which is a small nail through my ear, and that's a symbol to everyone in the community. I want to stay with this guy and his family. I want to go all in with him. The idea of a, of a bond servant is, is someone who says, I want my will to be consumed with my master's will. And it's done as an act of love, verse 5. An act of love, a voluntary opportunity to say, I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. And, and as you read through this narrative, you might be thinking of some New Testament ideas. Psalm 40, verse 6 says, the son offered his ear to the father. He opened his ear to say, Father, I am your bondservant. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, Jesus, though he was in the very nature of God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. So he made himself nothing. He made himself like a bondservant, like a doulos. And, and a bondservant doesn't say, here's what I want. A bondservant says something like this. Father, not what I will, but what you will be done. And this principle of the law, if we pull it out into a New Testament context, is really an example of an opportunity of what it means to follow God. To say, God, I don't want it to be about me. I don't want to sit on the throne. I want to voluntarily offer to give you my ear, to give you my life, and to say, I am all in with you. You see, the law of God is revealing the heart of God, and we see that Jesus fulfilled this very law, this law of voluntary bondser. Now, in verse 12, we're going to see not just the idea that this indentured servanthood was temporary and, and a way to protect human dignity and, and the rights of people. But we're also going to see how, how justice would work its way out when someone did something bad to someone else. Verse 12, anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it's not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, there are, there are a, a flee, you are to flee to a place that I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken away from my altar and put to death. Anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. And I'm like, whoa, this is, this is kind of serious, right? I mean, didn't God just say, don't murder? Isn't that enough? Well, these laws are kind of like amendments under that law to say, well, the motive matters. If you premeditate to kill someone, if you, if you study the way they go back and forth to work and you find them and you plot and you find a way to kill them and try to get away with it, then that, that's going to be a life for a life, that idea of premeditated murder. You kidnap someone, you plan it, you kidnap them, you're trying to take advantage, you curse your mother and father in public, you defy God, you blaspheme. These areas of just saying, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I don't care what anyone else says, those, those are capital crimes in this new covenant. But, but let's say you get into a fight and accidentally, you don't intend to, but now this person dies or, or, you're, or you're walking along the road and something happens and someone accidentally gets injured and, and you didn't intend it and there was no malicious nature in your heart, then God says there's a provision for that. You can run to a city of refuge. And in the city of refuge, a judge will help decide between you and, and the family member who's pursuing you if it was an accident or not because manslaughter in our nation has a very different punishment than premeditated first degree murder. God is creating a scale because motive matters. He's given them a place of refuge and a system to deal with these sort of issues. Now look with me at verse 22. 
And if people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined, whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is a serious injury, you are to take a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now you're like, oh man, this is, this is kind of heavy. Well, just for a moment, think with me. God is providing a punitive justice system that says there is no one above the law. And that's an important idea because when the Hebrews grew up for centuries, there was a lot of people who were above the law. If you were Egyptian, you could kill a Hebrew, there would be no penalty. If you were a king, if you had power, if you had money, you could do whatever you wanted with other people and no one could touch you. And God's saying, in my holy nation, with my covenant, listen, every life matters. Every life has equal value, born or unborn, rich or poor, Native born or immigrant. And so you're starting to look at these laws of protection of human dignity and punitive justice and what happens for personal injury. And then God's gonna give us another idea of not just punitive justice, but restorative justice. There are certain crimes that need to be paid with your very life, and then there are certain crimes that can actually restore a relationship between you and someone you've hurt, and we see these restorative laws of justice in chapter 22. Whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and for the sheep. And if a thief is caught breaking in at night and is struck by a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. But if it happens after sunrise, the defender is guilty of bloodshed. Anyone who steals must certainly make restitution. But if they have nothing, they must be sold to pay their debt. If a stolen animal is found alive in their possession, whether ox or donkey or sheep, they must pay back double. Again, God's given provision. If you kill a thief and it's daylight, you're guilty of a crime. If it's night and you can't see, you don't know if he has a weapon, you, you, you're not gonna be guilty. All of these provisions are meant to promote the type of justice that, that God wants to see in a society because he knows people need boundaries and he knows people are looking for loopholes of the law. Even though he already said, don't steal and don't murder, he knows human depravity. The freedom of human choice will hurt the people around him. He's trying to create a community of equity and justice and liberty for all. So here's the second idea we see. Restoration reflects God's heart. And we see this in all the laws about theft. In all the laws we see about this phrase, restitution. What is restitution about? Well, God is saying in a holy nation, when one person does something wrong and that hurts another person, sometimes they have to pay with their life if they take a life. But more often than not, most of the crimes and most of the offenses that are committed can in some way be paid back. So if you steal your neighbor's sheep or cow or ox or donkey, you're not just gonna pay back an ox for an ox and a donkey for a donkey. No, sometimes you're gonna pay back double. Sometimes you're gonna pay back four times and sometimes you're gonna pay back five times of what you stole from the other person as a form of restitution, as a form of restoration. You see, if I knew, if I steal your donkey or I steal your car, and all that's gonna happen if I get caught is like, give it back, my bad. That's not gonna be too much of a deterrent. But if I know if I steal your car, I'm gonna buy you five cars? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. And what happens when you go back to that person and say, because I stole your donkey, now I'm gonna work for the next several years to buy you five more donkeys. And listen, this idea of restorative justice is a powerful concept. Because if our justice system is just punitive and we lock every person up, whoever commits a crime against another person, relationships are not restored and we just create this massive, Prison system. But some of the most effective prison systems and justice systems in our country have this idea of restorative justice, where if a crime is committed, that person will work to pay back that family for what's been stolen or lost or broken. And it also rebuilds a trust. And some of those graduation moments, the thief 
hugs the victim and they become brothers and sisters. It's a beautiful process that God has created. And, and this works with kids. So as part of our raising of our three boys, there was a moment in time where one of our sons stole $20 out of a wallet. Yeah, it happens in pastors' kids' lives too, yeah. And so when we, we discovered it and the con confession happened after intense interrogation, okay, well, so we need to pay, pay that money back because it was spent. And so we opened up to Exodus chapter 22 and said, guys, I want to share with you a principle of restitution. So when you steal something, well, sometimes you have to pay back twice as much, sometimes four, sometimes five. We'll cut it in the middle four times. So let's work for, Let's find a way for you to pay back $80. $80? Yeah, $80, because if you pay back this $80, it'll restore the trust within the family, and it'll make you think twice about ever stealing. Again, you know how many cars you have to wash for $80? You know how many lawns you have to mow for $80? A powerful lesson for your children to say, when you steal from another person, you don't just sin against God, you also sin against them, and that relationship needs to be restored. God is giving the people this beautiful template of restoration, of justice, of what it means to be for them a holy nation. And Jesus did this in Matthew chapter six and Matthew chapter 18. We see this as a gospel idea. If you are in church, if you're praying and singing and worshiping, and you know someone has something against you, you know someone is angry or offended or hurt because of something you did, stop singing, Leave church and go and make it right and then come back and worship. God, God, God is saying something very important about his value of human relationships being intact, being whole. Jesus said, if you have something against someone else, Matthew 18, don't tell all your friends, don't post, post it on social media. Go to the person and have a conversation in the hope of restoration. If they don't listen, then bring another person. If they don't listen, then bring the church. But the whole idea is that among God's people, a holy nation, there should be something that stands out in the way that we treat the vulnerable, in the way that we dispense justice, and in the way we restore broken relationships. And now in chapter 22, verse 16, we're gonna see a few more of these laws to understand, again, not just what the law states, but the heart behind the law. Verse 16 of chapter 22. If a man seduces a virgin who is not pledged to be married and sleeps with her, he must pay the bride price and she shall be his wife. And if her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he must still pay the bride price for virgins. And you're like, oh, <laughs> this is why I don't like the Bible. What's happening here? Well, well just remember for a second. Women were not seen or treated as equals. In most of the societies around the Hebrew people, women were property, just like cattle and sheep. And dating was not a thing. If you were a woman, you did not pick your husband. Your husband was picked for you as a part of arranged marriage. This is, the, this is the way the culture worked in the first century. So we have to understand, what is God saying about what is in this idea? He's basically creating a protection for women because women matter to God, he's saying, you can't just have a woman go to a house and be in an arranged marriage, and then if this man decides to have sex with her, he can go, well, it was just kind of a thing we had fun, and I'm, I have no obligation. If you're gonna have sex with this woman, you're gonna pay for her for the rest of your life. So you're gonna think twice about looking at a woman as a sexual object, because her purity matters to God, and her protection matters not just to her father, her protection matters to God. God is writing in the law this, this dignity for, for marriage, Purity and the bounds of, of sexuality. God cares about all of those things. Verse 25, we see, if you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal, charge no interest. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset, because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? And when they cry out to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. God's saying, in your dealings with your people, if you're a holy nation, don't charge interest and make that person a slave because they can't pay back your interests. And if you bar their cloak as collateral, if you're giving them something, by the end of the day, make sure you give them their cloak back because they're gonna be cold at night. It's their only form of warmth and protection. Do not be the person 
But because you have money or power or the ability to charge interest or give and then manipulate and control other people and, and make them live a life of servitude, don't ever do it like that because when they cry out to God, I'm gonna hear them and I'm gonna act against you. Don't oppress the widow or the orphan or the immigrant. These laws of God's heart for the vulnerable, those who have found themselves in difficult situations. And now verse 28, and do not blaspheme God or curse the ruler of your people. And do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats. You don't wanna be the type of person who's blaspheming God. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We read that last week. That, that was a capital offense in Israel. And don't be a person who speaks against your leaders. And you're like, well, God, um, God I think it's the Old Testament because, man, our, our, our president, our governor, our police chief, whew. Hey, guess what? One of the questions we have to ask is when we read these 613 laws, which of these apply to the New Testament? And the answer is every one of them that's restated in the New Testament applies. Under the new covenant, there are commands. There are opportunities for us to obey as a holy nation. And, and, and most of the new covenant commands actually, actually raise the stakes on issues like don't slander your leaders. 1 Timothy 2.1, not only are we called not to speak negatively about our leaders, whether a pastor or president or governor or mayor or police chief, we're commanded by God to pray for them. First Timothy 2, and to offer prayer and intercession. So we have to ask ourselves the question, are we the type of people who are known for slandering leaders we don't like and posting things on social media? Are we the type that choose not to slander and to pray? And it got real quiet. Because more often the church is known for why they're angry and who they're against and what they've said. And a holy nation says, no, we choose not to slander. We choose to pray and we choose to intercede. We choose to vote. We choose to act. We choose to serve. But we want to be different. We want to stand out. We want to be a peculiar people among all the nations. And we want to be generous. We, we want to be the type of people who don't hold back offerings. That we give as an act of worship as a response to faithful God, don't hold back your first fruits, don't hold back your offerings because those offerings provide for the poor and the priests. And that is written, stated in the law itself. And now chapter 23, verse one, we see another part of how God's laws work among his people. Do not spread false reports and do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness and do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. And when you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. Again, we see all of these commands restated in the New Testament. The way we slander people, the way we, in a court of law, might give false testimony. The way we, we might go with the crowd and pervert justice. Like everyone's over here saying, yeah, no, they're... They're speaking loudly or, again, on social media. Everyone's over here, but you're like, I don't, I don't know if that's right. And in a lawsuit, don't just side with someone because they're poor because you can be poor and not righteous. Just because someone that has money doesn't mean they're wrong. Make sure you're not siding with people because of who they are or what they have. Don't pervert justice. Don't go with the crowd. Make sure what you say with your mouth can't be seen by a holy God as slander because we're gonna give an account for every idle word we speak and we start to get the sense that God is creating this, this standard for what a holy nation looks like. Now, now, when you start thinking about this, I mean, there's a part of me that says this. Why, why not just 10 commandments? Or as Jesus said, all the 10 commandments can be summed up in this way. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And wouldn't it be great if we just lived out those two laws of love? We wouldn't need all 613 commandments. Here's the problem. The reason we need 613 commandments, the reason we need laws and commands, even in the New Testament, to help us understand about slander and gossip and the value of life and justice is because people are always looking for loopholes. We have this infinite ability as human beings to rationalize or justify our own sin while easily pointing out the sin of other people. 
And so when you think about some of these laws, you're like, that, that law, law is crazy. In fact, if you wanna do something for fun, go home and Google the craziest laws in the United States of America. And as you read the craziest laws in the United States of America, you gotta ask yourself this question. Why did they create that law? The craziest laws ever created were created because someone did something stupid. And so they made a law to say, don't do that stupid thing again. Like, here's a couple of examples. You know, in Wyoming, it's against the law to ski drunk. Hmm. I can imagine why they made that law. Don't ever do that again, and no one else should. You know, it's against the law in Oklahoma to eavesdrop on someone else's conversations. Hmm. In Louisiana, it's illegal to wrestle a bear. <laughs> and I would add maybe while drunk. I'm not sure who decided to do that. But And Pennsylvania, it's against the law to sell your child. These laws were created because people look for loopholes. They... They thought, well, it doesn't explicitly say I can't sell my son or I can't wrestle a bear, I can't ski drunk, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that anyway, even if it harms other people. And this is, the, this is something that amazes me about God. The, the almighty creator of heaven and earth has stooped down so low. He's not just interested in 10 commandments. He goes into these great details about the way we handle engagement of a woman Who's vulnerable? How we care for the life of an unborn child during an accidental fight. How we care for a tooth that gets knocked out of a servant. How we care for an immigrant because he knows the human condition to care more about ourselves than the people around us. And he's like, no, you're a holy nation. So justice matters and restoration matters. Yeah, we, we, can, we, can, we can thank God for that because that's forming us as his people. I mean, just to give you an idea of human depravity, as we read through the story, God has freed the people, led them to the Red Sea, fed them by manna on the ground and water from a rock, led them by a cloud and fire, helped them defeat all their enemies and said, there are no other gods before me. Don't make a graven image. And they've said, we will obey everything you've said. And in two or three chapters from now, what are they gonna do? They're gonna make a golden calf out of their earrings. And they're gonna worship this golden calf and say, this is the God who brought us out of Egypt, out of slavery. And it's easy to go, those stupid, stubborn people. But the Bible is a mirror. And if we look close enough, we'll see ourselves. And this is why this law can continue to shape us as his people. And so this a last set of laws in the 613 laws that seems to stand out in a different kind of way because because God is gonna now command his people, not just the do nots. There are 365 do nots in the 613 commands. Most do nots. There are 248 do's, things that we're supposed to do. And of the do's, God is gonna now command his people to celebrate. Why does God have to command his people to celebrate? Well, because he knows something maybe we don't. Look at me, verse 14 chapter 23. Three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Eat bread made without yeast as I command you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv. For in that month you came out of Egypt and no one is to appear before me empty handed. Celebrate the festival of the harvest with the first fruits of the crops that you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. And three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. So here's what God knows that maybe they don't. Here's what God knows that maybe we don't. That, that celebration forms identity. What you celebrate shapes you as a, a collective nation and shapes you as an individual. What you remember and we're commanded 240 times in the Bible to remember. That remembering shapes our values and our identity as a people. And God's saying, there are three times I want you to remember. A rhythm of rest, a rhythm of reflection, 
a rhythm of remembering, to form a new DNA, because remember, these people had no traditions, no celebrations. They've been slaves for 430 years. He's gonna create a rhythm of celebration. The first one is the festival of the unleavened bread, known as Passover. Every year, you're gonna celebrate Passover. Every year, you're gonna eat bread without leaven for seven days. Every year, it's a celebration where you're gonna remember your freedom story, that God took you from slavery to freedom, and that story is gonna shape you it's gonna shape you as you raise your kids. God is the God who brought us to freedom. And just to give us an idea of how, how an idea like Passover might shape us, we, we have two American holidays where we remember and celebrate, and they shape and form our identity. Last weekend, we remembered the price of freedom. Memorial Day, where at Arlington Cemetery, they placed 250,000 flags on tombstones of men and women who laid down their lives so that we could be free. And we remember the price of freedom. We don't take for granted what we have. And then on 4th of July, we, we don't just as much remember as we celebrate. We celebrate with fireworks, we celebrate with barbecues, that we are a free nation, that we are a free nation in that Declaration of Independence where we see this self-evident idea that all men are created equal. And we pursue that and we celebrate that. And that forms us as a nation. That's what the Passover was for the people. Then this, the next holiday they're supposed to celebrate every year to form their identity is the celebration of the festival of the harvest. You also see this known as the festival of weeks. You've also heard it as Pentecost, that seven weeks after Passover, 50 days after Passover. There's a celebration of the wheat harvest, of the provision of God that God has provided. And in America, we have this beautiful holiday we call Thanksgiving. You know, not every country in the world has a day set aside where they gather and just stop and think about all they have to be grateful for. In the month of harvest, God's provision, God's bounty Hey, can we talk about all the ways that God has been good, the things we're grateful for? You see, Thanksgiving forms us as a people. It forms us as a family. That's why God is commanding these rhythms of celebration. And I don't know if you know this or not, but it's Pentecost. This is Feast of Harvest where the Holy Spirit is poured out on the early church and they don't just see a harvest of wheat in the field. They see a harvest of souls as thousands of people give their lives to Christ for the first time in one of the biggest moments of the church. And maybe you don't know this or not, but today is Pentecost Sunday. That 2,000 years ago, that day, 3,000 people gave their life to Christ in one moment. And so those moments of remembering help us think, man, God is good. He's not just bringing physical harvest. He's, he's bringing emotional, spiritual, revival type of harvest. This is who God is. And then the feast of the ingathering. This is at the end of the year. This is the very end of, the, of their year where they stop and think. It's kind of like our New Year celebration where we stop on December 31st and we look back on the whole year and we just sort of, we sort of think about all the ways that God has worked and all of the plans we had and how God redirected them. And we look toward the new plans. This would eventually be, be called the, the Festival of Booths or the Festival of Tabernacles where the people would actually leave outside their homes and live in tents and have a big camping trip that last week of the year to create a rhythm of just reflection and relaxation and life together. And all of these are forming the people. So how does our church celebrate? I mean, this, this has to make us ask the question, okay, so maybe we don't celebrate exactly in the same way or for the same reasons, but what are our rhythms? I mean, in our country, we have Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, 4th of July, Thanksgiving, these uniquely American things that form us. But what about in our church? Well, we celebrate things like a vision weekend where, where people get into the store, where people take their steps of faith. We, we celebrate what's happening with, with, with kids on, on Move Up Weekend. We, we celebrate in youth retreats like YE. We, we celebrate every time someone's baptized, that, that on the weekend they're baptized, we have them stand up and we applaud them because we know that's probably not gonna happen when they go to work the next day. Every weekend, someone walks forward in our sanctuary, whether here at another campus, you will see spontaneous applause. That's a tradition of celebration that says, we love celebrating God, going after the one 
We love passing our faith on to the next generation. We love watching vision in the rhythm of our church be celebrated as we take new ground. Last weekend, we celebrated with over 680 people in Orlando. 25 years of helping to find a home for every child. All these foster families and adopted families for the last 25 years gathered and broke bread together and had a festival, a celebration. And, and new families and families that had been on the journey for a long time just had this beautiful moment. That was a moment that someone created and said, this is something worth celebrating. And so here's the question for us. So how have you worked those rhythms of celebration into your life? Because here's what we know about dysfunctional families. Dysfunctional families fail to celebrate. Healthy families find reasons to celebrate. How do I take a, an ordinary birthday and not just remember the birthday, but make that birthday special? And in our family, we, we sort of do this thing called the honor chair. So on your birthday, after we sing happy birthday, after we, as we eat the cake, we basically have the birthday boy or girl have a seat and we just speak into their life. Here's what we see, how you've grown this year. Here's what I've seen you do, maybe when no one else is looking. This is why we're proud of you as a grandpa and a grandma and an aunt and an uncle and a cousin and a friend, a part of just like a 10 minute part of a birthday that speaks life and identity into a family. Maybe it's the way you celebrate a particular anniversary. Maybe it's the way you talk to your kids about the family vacation. For a friend of mine, it was her and a couple of roommates saying, hey, it's been one year on my journey of cancer and we're gonna have a dinner and I wanna thank you for walking with me through that one year of cancer treatment where we didn't know what was gonna happen and for you praying for me every day. Maybe for you, it's celebrating sobriety. On that year, every day, it's been three years, four years, five years. You hold this special festival. Listen, there's, there's always a reason in life not to celebrate. But we're not supposed to wait till heaven to remember. We're not supposed to wait for heaven to celebrate. In the book of Nehemiah chapter nine, the entire country is a mess. The wall has been rebuilt, the temples have been rebuilt, but there's all these economic, social, political problems, and the people hear God's word read to them, and they start to weep because they realize as far as they've come, they have so much farther to go. And Nehemiah says, stop, stop crying. Today is the day you celebrate because the joy of the Lord is your strength. God commands his people to celebrate, right? And so we wanna be the type of people who weave into the life of our church celebration moments. We wanna be the type of people who weave in rhythms of celebration in those ordinary moments of life. If you come from a family that never celebrated, you have a chance to recreate a whole bunch of new traditions because these people had no traditions and God forms them by giving them just a few to begin to celebrate as a holy nation. And this is the purpose of God's law, 613 commandments. It's not a stairway to heaven. It's not a checklist to earn the favor of God. It's a way to form a nation with identity, a sense of purpose. It's a way to say, I want there to be liberty and justice for all in this nation. I want there to be a, a habit of restoring relationships that are broken. And I want a rhythm of celebration because that's gonna form my people. And I pray today that Calvary Chapel and all of our campuses that we do go after the one, that we have a heart for the vulnerable, that we treat everyone the same. And then when conflict happens, we work and fight and pray and, and, and ask for help to mediate those broken relationships and that we, we learn to celebrate because Jesus is worth celebrating, his kingdom is worth celebrating, and we, his people, are caught up in this beautiful story of the kingdom of God. Let's thank Jesus for his good work in us, in his church, and let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and this reminder of your law, these 603 other commands that some of them don't make sense to us, but we see in each of them your heart for justice, for restoration, for celebration. And Father, I pray that even as we celebrate Move Up Weekend, that you would compel those of us in this army that say, you know what, I wanna 
I wanna get into the story at the next level that we take that step of faith and maybe lead a group for the first time. Serve in some way those younger ones coming after us that we could teach them the love of your word and what it means to follow you. And Father, in this room and in all of our campuses, we pray that if there's anyone who doesn't know your love, that you would draw them now by your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before I say... <laughs> I beat him to it. All right. So Pastor Doug had asked, in this message I heard this morning, but I didn't hear it last night, what does a holy nation look like? And then you translate that to the New Testament, what does a holy life look like? And Christians, you and I, we should be known for what we're for, not for always what we're against. We should be for the goodness of God, the grace of God, the kindness of God, the, the reconciliation of God. Be reconciled to God. And that you all, as a Christian, you are ministers of reconciliation, which means you are to take the gospel and you are to take it to other people and help them also to be reconciled to God. You are ministers of reconciliation. You know, you've heard a lot of the little acronyms, like a lot of people in their emails or the text, they'll put LOL at the end, and that stands for, and YOLO stands for, you only live once. That's kind of the, the way of the world. And then there's a new one, well, it's new to me because I'm not a very good texter, but it's, it's FOMO, fear of missing out. And that's what I was contemplating and I was explaining to somebody last night is I don't obey God's commands because I have to, but I don't want my own will. You know, God, please do not give me my will. God is so good and he's so kind. He always has our best interest in mind. It's like, I don't want my will anymore. I want his will. I have this fear of missing out and when I live disobedient to God or I'm not reconciled with God or I'm not walking closely with Him, I have this fear that I'm going to miss out on some of the best things that God has for our lives. And that's what should keep you holy, is your love for God and you just want the very best life that God has planned for you. You don't want to go, believe me, you don't want to go your own way. You want to walk closely in relationship with Jesus. Be reconciled to God. And then secondly, stay reconciled to God. So we're going to have uh, some prayer partners after the last song. Pastor Andrew and the worship team is going to close us out. And if you're a parent, remember you have a meeting over in 678 Middle School right after service for 15 minutes just to get you updated on all that. But after the last word for song is done, we're gonna have some prayer partners up front. And if you're not reconciled to God, you're thinking, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I was to pass from this life and go into the next that I'm reconciled to God. I don't really have that moment in time on this particular day, at this particular moment, I ask God to forgive me my sins, and I received inside of myself the Holy Spirit that made me reconciled to God. If you don't have personal relationship with Jesus or you, you're not reconciled, you're not walking with Jesus, you're, you're kind of going in the general direction, but you know, you're just not on that highway of holiness like you once were. We're going to have some people up front. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. So Andrew's going to close us out, prayer partners afterwards, parents meeting across the hall. God bless you. And Pastor Jerry's on vacation this week. He'll be back soon enough. And uh, just pray that he has a great relaxing time with his family. God bless you. And thank you for coming. Amen. Let's stand together as we close out in worship.